Good afternoon, everyone, if you're on the East Coast, as I am, or if you're on the West Coast, as Bob Johansson is. Good morning to you. Bob, welcome. Welcome to you. Yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We would love to know where you're calling in from today, and we'd also love to give you a chance to get to know the GoToWebinar panel if you're new to this type of event. So if you could take a quick moment and find the GoToWebinar question panel and tell us where you're calling in from, we'd love to welcome and greet you as we begin the hour together. And I'm going to give some shout outs to you as we begin. Looks like we have Missouri, New Hampshire, Seattle, Arizona, California, Detroit. Wisconsin, Tennessee, Utah, Milwaukee, Boston, Missouri, um, Orlando, Florida, right in the alley of Hurricane Irma, uh, Virginia, LA, Washington, Pepperdine, Toronto. It looks like we have some callers in Palo Alto, Bob, where you are today at the Institute for the Future. So welcome as you continue to join the call. We're so thrilled that you've joined us today. Um, you may or may not know that this is a very big week for Bob Johansson. Uh, yesterday was the publication date of his latest book, The New Leadership Literacies. It's now available and we'll be talking more about the content from the book on today's event. As we get started, there are a few things I want to let you know about. The first is that if you would like to live tweet and share your thoughts about today's event, we invite you to use the hashtag hashtag new leadership literacies um, so the title of the book minus the new leadership literacies you can also tag the Institute for the futures uh, Twitter handle IFTF um, also you might be wondering about today's recording we are creating one and we will share it with you later so that if you have friends or colleagues who might like to participate or watch later that will be available to them Additionally, we will be sending a PDF of today's slides so that you can have those as a reference and for continued learning. In case you're having trouble at all viewing the slides, I want to make you aware also that GoToWebinar Viewer allows you to zoom in and out on the cameras and on the slides. So if you find yourself wanting the words on the slides to be bigger, you are in control of that. And I invite you to adjust your screen as needed so that you can enjoy this event to the fullest. As we begin, I'm, I'm thrilled to introduce uh, Bob Johansson. Bob, I've really enjoyed getting to know you uh, while we've been working to launch your book. Um, as I mentioned before, Bob is an author of more uh, of 10 books, including the latest, The New Leadership Literacies, and he's been helping organizations around the world prepare for and shape the future for more than 30 years. He's done that in his role as a distinguished fellow at the Institute for the Future, where he also served as president from 1996 to 2004 and later served on the board. Uh, now Bob travels around the country working with organizations, helping them prepare for the future. And I'm so thrilled, Bob, for the chance to learn with you today. Great. So I hope all of you will stick around. Bob is going to present the content from his book at the beginning of this hour and then toward the end of the hour I will come back on and we'll take some questions. So I want to invite you throughout the event to add your questions and when I come back on we'll be sharing some questions and answers together. Also if you can stay to the very end I do have a special giveaway so I hope that you'll stay with us for the entire hour. So Bob I'm going to go off camera and uh, I'll be back with you later. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Becky. Great to be with you all. And I'd uh, first like to introduce my co-author here, uh, Atticus, who's a very quiet, big red rescue golden. Uh, and I couldn't have done this without him. Uh, well, here's the big secret that I want to share with you this morning. This is the logo from Institute for the Future, designed by my colleague Gene Hagen, designed on an original Etch-a-Sketch, which you remember that technology. It's a continuous line function that spells out I-F-T-F, and it's very hard to read if you look at it up close. But if you hold it away, as I'm doing now, it becomes more clear. So that's the big secret of this. If you look 10 years ahead, it's actually easier to forecast than it is if you look only one or two years ahead. So often I'm asked, how can you do a 10-year forecast? I can't even do one or two years. Well, the reason is because it's easier to do a 10-year forecast. So what I'm doing here this morning is sharing with you my view of the next decade and then asking the question, what leadership literacy will it take to thrive? Here's the underlying forecast. Looking 10 years ahead, anything that can be distributed will be distributed. 
So this is the world we're going to live in. It's quite inevitable at this stage, and it's very clear if you look 10 years ahead, even though right now the word I use to describe the current mood is scramble. It's a scramble. There's scramblers all around us, and the people who are good at scrambling are going to unstick things that have been stuck for a long time. They're not likely to be very good at resticking them, at putting things back together. Because of this forecast, anything that can be distributed will be distributed. And then the second core forecast, the second core forecast is the future will reward clarity, being very clear where you're going, but very flexible about how you get there. And in that world, it'll reward clarity, but it'll punish punish certainty because certainty is just too rigid, too brittle, and hierarchical structures of leadership will almost always lose to more flexible structures in this kind of world. So the base literacy is the literacy of looking backward from the future to act now with clarity. So it's what we call here at Institute for the Future foresight, insight, action. That's the basic model. When I first developed this 10 years ago in a book called Get There Early, this was a little more mechanical, kind of unidirectional model. Now it's much more organic. It's much more bidirectional. It's much more organic in, a, in the sense of unpredictable. And there is cycles. So this next decade, this world of distributed everything, there's less linear thinking and more cyclical thinking. And what I'm going to present for you today is foresight, uh, stories from the future that are plausible, internally consistent, and provocative with signals to bring them to life to provoke your insight. So in a real sense, it doesn't matter if you agree with my forecast at all. It only matters if you're provoked by it. And indeed, some of the best forecasts are those you don't like, <laughs> the forecasts that make you feel uncomfortable. But if they provoke you, to have a kind of aha, an insight, a new story, a new pattern of connections in your brain. Once you have an insight, you can't go back. So insights are much more deep and profound than an idea. So foresight, it turns out, is really good at provoking insight. And in this case, it's all insight about leadership. And the goal of this is to make better decisions in the present. So we're not here to predict. Uh, nobody can predict the future. If somebody tells you they can predict the future, you shouldn't believe them, especially if they're from California. <laughs> but what you can do is you can use foresight to provoke insight. And ideally, what we're doing is exercising our brains so we can make better decisions in the present. So once you have that foresight, insight, action, discipline, then you need to engage in what I call voluntary fear. And this world of the future, it's what the military calls the VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. It's a frightening future. Uh, this is the most frightening 10-year forecast I've ever been involved in in my 30 plus years of forecasting. But it's also, it's also the most hopeful. So we need to engage with the fear and learn how to thrive in it anyway. And the good news is we've got a generation of young people coming up now who are growing up with video gaming. And I know a lot of parents have a lot of concerns about it and it's appropriate to be concerned, but the basic medium of gaming, this medium of emotion-laden attention with digital interfaces that are roughly 10 times better than anything we have in offices, that allows us to engage in fear. And if you think ahead, we're moving toward a world where young people will bring gaming experience to work and it will be a big competitive advantage for them. And I'm thinking young people here now, 21 or less in 2017, but the younger you are, the stronger the effect. And there's great detail in the book making the case for why that's so important. Once you have that voluntary fear engagement in a foresight inside action framework, you realize that the kind of organizations that we're going to be facing in this world of distributed everything, the kind of organizations are going to be less hierarchical and more shape shifting, 
shape-shifting organizations. So just imagine for a moment a typical organizational chart, kind of structured, hierarchical. But what if, what if the organization chart looked more like this? Think of this as, it's, you know, it's kind of a fishnet lying on the dock. You pick up a node, a temporary hierarchy forms. You put down that node, you pick up another node, another hierarchy forms. So in this world, you have organizations that have no center, that hierarchies come and go. They're still important and they add value, but they're just not rigid. They're not brittle anymore. They grow from the edges and they can't be controlled. So as leaders, you need to learn how to thrive in this kind of organization. And even this, it's not static. So it looks more like this. And if you get a sense of how this undulates, uh, this is the world of the future we're looking at. There's a constant movement. The hierarchies come and go. It's growing from the edges. There's a constant movement. And it's really landscapes of organizations, not just singular organizations, landscapes of these shape-shifting organizations. And here's the challenge. The people who are best at these shape-shifting organizations are the criminals, especially terrorist groups. The rest of us aren't nearly as good at it. So the challenge for us is how can we learn from others that are in many cases criminals or terrorists, how can we learn how they organize, how they work, how they get things done, and then apply it for the good, apply it for a more hopeful future. So these shape-shifting organizations will grow from the edges, and it's at the edges where diversity and innovation thrive. So when I was in graduate school in the 70s, diversity was all about social equity. And it still is to some extent, but now, especially in a place like Silicon Valley, diversity is all about innovation. And if you look around in Silicon Valley, everything is cross-cultural. So it's not an American phenomenon, it's a cross-cultural phenomenon. And these shape-shifting organizations make it more possible to innovate, more possible to incorporate diversity in our work. So, these distributed organizations, these shape-shifting organizations, require us as leaders to be better than being there, essentially to be there when they're, we're not there. And most of today's leaders um, are really good in person. They're very charismatic, very engaging, very personal. But if they're not there physically, they degrade quickly. They're not very good at social media. They're not very good at video conferencing or audio or whatever. They're just not nearly as good when they're not there physically. But if you look 10 years ahead, you see that this is gonna be a world where leaders and workers will work together through massive webs of sensors, some of which people will wear and some of which will be embedded in their bodies. So I work mostly with senior leadership groups now. Typical group I work with, half of them will be wearing Flit, Fitbit or, or Apple Watch or some kind of body sensor. But if you look 10 years ahead and you think of a senior leadership group and a shape-shifting organizations, all of them will be wearing body sensors of some kind if they want them, and half of them will have embedded body sensors. So what it means is we have the ability, not just through media, but through these massive webs of sensors to better understand what's going on with each other and make smarter decisions and the challenge I talk about this a lot in the book. The challenge is how to get close, but not too close. What the robotics people call the uncanny valley. You don't want to get too close, but you do want to stay very close. And then finally, finally, we move into this world of creating and sustaining positive energy. So this is the the fifth, and, and, and in, a, in a way, the, the most important of all the leadership literacies, because if we don't do this, nothing else works. It's the ability to create and sustain positive energy. Now, that's always been important for leaders. It's never been so hard as it is in this VUCA world to create and sustain positive energy without being Pollyanna. I mean, you've got to be realistic, but you've got to embed hope because 
all of us in this next 10 years, all of us are in the hope game, especially providing hope for this next generation of young people as they enter the workforce. Uh, if young people come in to the workforce, they're all going to be digitally connected. If they come in and they're hopeful and they're digitally connected, they'll be inspiring. They'll bring new things to work, new energy, new basis for innovation. But if they come in and they're hopeless and digitally connected, then, then they're dangerous. They're dangerous. So, Think of this yourself now and how you can move into an environment where leaders will need to be physically, mentally, and even spiritually, though not necessarily religiously fit in ways they were never required to be before. So it, you know, it's always been important to be fit, but in this world, in this world of the next decade, we're going to have to be super fit, super fit to be able to thrive. So just a little quick test to evaluate yourself by these criteria. When I walk into a room, I radiate positive energy. And again, it's got to be kind of authentic and, and, and realistic positive energy. I have a disciplined approach to my own physical, mental, and spiritual, not necessarily religious, fitness in the face of my daily work pressures. And the good news is there's better resources for this now. In the book, I outline a West Coast, an East Coast, a global and integrated strategy for well-being for leaders. So we got better tools and better sensors than we've ever had, but it's still a challenge. I balance my personal energy throughout my working day. I moderate my peaks and droops. I'm resilient, resilient under pressure because there's so much more pressure for leaders in this kind of world. And then finally, I create space for the people I lead to balance their own physical, mental, and spiritual energy. So interestingly, here in Silicon Valley, mindfulness is everywhere. I mean, there's a real effort to teach everybody about mindfulness, which is great. It's a good start. But this is about a lot more than mindfulness. It's about how do you create that sense of well-being, that sense of center in the VUCA, the shape-shifting world of the future. So this is the final um, overview that I want to share with you, and then we'll open it to questions, the final overview of these five new leadership literacies. And I should say I built this out of the experience I had with my previous book called um, called the, the, the book was specifically called about the leadership skills called Leaders Make the Future. Uh, and I outlined in that 10 future leadership skills. And this book starts where that one finished. Those 10 skills are right, but now we're wrapping these literacies around the skills that are talked about in Leaders Make the Future. So just to recall, it's the core is the ability to look back from the future, but act now. Uh, to engage in voluntary fear, to learn how to lead shape-shifting organizations, to be there when you're not there, and finally, to create and sustain positive energy. So just to review the basic concept of this next decade, this fact of life that we're all going to live with, is that anything that can be distributed will be distributed. And then secondly, the future will reward clarity, but punish, but punish certainty. So in the military, I've had the chance since 9-11 to volunteer at the Army War College, and I, I go there several times a year now. And I'm working with the generals and with the senior leaders. Uh, and what they've taught me during that period of time is that they're the ones who coined the term VUCA world to begin with. And what they say is you need what they call commander's intent or mission command, or the latest term is flexive command. Be very clear about where you're going, but very flexible about how you get there. Because command and control hierarchies, it's just too brittle, too rigid for this kind of future that's emerging. So those are the basic literacies. Uh, that's my basic forecast. And I hope now we can open it to your questions. Thank you, and I invite you back into the room, Becky. And I am here. Thank you, Bob. Um, so I do have some questions that have been coming in from our attendees, but I, I wanted to start um, by asking you a little bit about your own 
uh, journey as a leader. And you and I have had this conversation before, Bob, about what you do to stay physically, mentally, spiritually fit to lead others. And I, I think our attendees could benefit from hearing that. <laughs> sure. Um, well, I think each of us has to decide what works for us. There's no magic answer to this. Um, part of my uh, as a, a basketball player, and I went to Illinois as a, as a, um, on a basketball scholarship and played there, although I wasn't a great player. It's kind of a marginal Big Ten player. But I was a serious athlete in college and then became a degenerate graduate student um, and went to divinity school. That was my first understanding of religion and spirituality. So I'm not committed to any brand of religion, but I am really interested in the, the importance of spirituality and religion. Uh, and then my PhD, which is based in sociology, I was thinking originally I was going to be focused as a professor of sociology of religion, but then the internet happened and I got really interested in this whole concept of network connectivity. So bring that all back together. What I think each of us needs to do as leaders is come up with a daily discipline of fitness that provides us with perspective. You know, we all need our own clarity too, and that comes from our spiritual life or our mindfulness or comes from inside of us. And then we do need a physical discipline. Um, I have exercise equipment in my study, a recumbent bike, uh, an elliptical trainer, but whatever works for you. And in, in the book, I talk about an East Coast model for this, which is very structured and gymnasium-based, a West Coast model that's very neuroscience-based and individualized and web-based. A global, a global model that's based on looking around the world and finding the places in the world where people live the longest, healthiest lives and die the quickest. <laughs> uh, and then finally, various approaches to integration. So the key message here is it's more important than it's ever been. The tools and the resources are better than they ever been, but we still have to make our own choices. And those choices are going to be based on your past and your discipline. That's very helpful, Bob. So I'm going to jump straight to our attendee questions because there are so many. And um, one I'm seeing a couple of times is related to your conversation about fear engagement or voluntary fear engagement. Could you talk a bit more about that and explain that, please? Sure. Um, so my experience at the Army War College has been very instructive there. I got to visit the National Training Center in the Mojave Desert which I came to think of as the world's largest video gaming parlor. It's about the size of the state of Rhode Island. And it has real tanks, real helicopters, real Afghan actors. It's very realistic. People play there, play a game for two weeks, 24 hours a day. Most people lose because it's designed to be harder than real warfare. And some people are killed without having to die. Very instructive. Um, and it turns out that's the most realistic exposure to fear I've ever seen. Now, there's variations of that that you see now coming out of the video gaming world. And I think there's a tendency to judge video gaming based on the content of today's video games, which, in my opinion, are often too sexual and too violent. But if you think of it as a medium, I believe what we currently think of as video gaming will become the most powerful learning medium in history. And we're getting a good hint of that. The military is way ahead of us. In business, healthcare is ahead of us. Uh, in the design and the teaching, and a lot of the good medical schools now make heavy use of, of simulation and even robots uh, for our models that help people diagnose and learn uh, without taking as much risk. Uh, aerospace is doing very well, but there's not a single company I know that practices good learning discipline using gaming across the whole company. Perhaps the best I've seen is electronic arts, and you would think that. Uh, because they're a gaming company, but they actually do apply it to themselves and in EA University, that's how they teach. That's a great example. Um, so along those lines, Nicholas is asking, Bob, how you envision the literacies being translated to corporate learning and development. So do you think, Bob, that organizations need to change the way they develop these competencies? And as you're speaking about different different industries which are using gaming for learning. How do you see other organizations needing to translate their corporate learning and development? Yeah, um, so here again, it's easier to 
it's easier to look 10 years ahead than it is just to look one year ahead. Uh, in today's environment, most companies and learning organizations make limited use of simulation. Uh, some of them do uh, business school type simulation, which are fine, but they just don't include much of the VUCA world, <laughs> much of that radical uncertainty, that fear engagement. Uh, so they also do things like simple role play simulations, but again, not very robust. But if you look 10 years ahead, and you think about the interfaces we're going to have available. If you look 10 years ahead, this is basically the end of cyberspace as we've known it. Cyberspace was the place where we go online. And now, if you look 10 years ahead, the place where we go online will be the same as when we're in the physical world. We'll all have virtual overlays on the physical world, maybe through our glasses, maybe through bone implants, maybe through something else that makes a much more graceful interface. So bring that back to learning. Everything's going to be a learning opportunity. So right now in the short run, we're able to say, well, everything's going to be shopping because you're, you, know, you can buy anything by just looking at it, finding out what it is, and then buy it. Um, that's sort of the first step probably is, is we'll be able to shop wherever we are. But the more profound uh, step is going to be when we're able to learn wherever we are. Uh, and the challenge for leadership and development programs, which I teach many of those now, the challenge is how do you embed these techniques of, I call it immersive learning, how do you embed those? Um, we have here at Institute for the Future an underground section uh, that's designed, uh, our colleague Toshi Hu leads this effort, and it's designed so we can do virtual, augmented, or mixed reality experiences. Um, and for example, we had in the board of directors of a major airline, and we simulated the back seat of a 747, um, and we had the board members eat bland airline food while having a virtual reality mask and sensors in their nose and sensors in their ears. So it was like they were using, eating sizzling fish. Now that changed their thinking and led to a really interesting conversation about how do you use virtual mixed augmented reality to create a different airline experience? It, it doesn't make it great, but it certainly made it a lot better. And that's the kind of challenge that we need. How do you take learning and fold it into strategy, thinking about learning not just as episodic, but as more continuous and, and much richer in terms of the interfaces? Wow, uh, that's a lot to, to wrap thinking around. and. Uh, Thank you from from the person who asked the question. He's really thrilled with your answer, Bob. So, um, it's not so easy. I had a, it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, um, I noticed several questions, and it struck a chord with me as well when you showed the graphic with the shape shifting organizations, and you mentioned that terrorist organizations are the early adopters of, you know, the leadership from the edges and the shape shifting organizations. Um, can you talk a little bit more um, ab about that, and what can we learn? from those early adopters of these new ways of leading. Yeah, and here, I'm not an expert in this. I'm not a military guy by background. I just kind of happened into this relationship that I've learned so much with, with the Army War College. And I've come away so much more respectful of our military and what they're doing and how they're learning to lead. So in the military, the equivalent of this, you could think about the conventional Army. Uh, they are still rather hierarchical. But if you look at the special forces, they're much more shape-shifting. And almost every organization has some shape-shifting element. So I showed this model to one of the world's leading consultancies uh, recently. And, and one of them looked at it and said, oh, yeah, we do that. And in a sense, they're right, that really good consultants, really good universities, really good corporations, they all have portions that are shape-shifting. But very few do it on any large scale. But if you look at how the criminal economy is emerging, so look at things like blockchain and Bitcoin and some of the uses of alternative currencies, there's far more sophisticated organizational structure than we see in many of the traditional organizations. So I think what we need to do is to learn from how different groups organize, including groups that we don't agree with or maybe even are, are opposed to and are even fighting, uh, we still have to learn 
from how they organize and how they do things. Um, and in many cases, they do things better than the rest of us. Um, so we often see in the early stages of technology development, we often see the early users are not very desirable characters. But that doesn't mean we can't learn from them. And that's the challenge that we, the challenge that we have. That helps, thanks. Uh, Bob, several people have asked for more detail around what you mean when you say everything that can be distributed will be distributed. And um, one of our listeners is asking, you know, what's the difference between, is it explicit knowledge that's going to be distributed? What about tacit knowledge? Um, yeah. So can you, can you talk a bit more about the distribution of everything and, and its implications for organizations? That's a great question. Uh, I, I particularly like the explicit versus tacit. So think back to the roots of this, and then I'll come back and address that directly. Um, this all started um, when the ARPANET was getting started, the early days before it was even called the internet. Uh, one of our founders is Paul Barron, who um, is usually credited with inventing what's called packet switching. Um, and as he told the story to me before he passed away, he said um, that he was asked by our military to come up with a network that would resist nuclear attack. This was in the Cold War period, 1964. Uh, and he and others invented what came to be called packet switching. Um, and it was a network structure where you send the message, and again, I'm a humble social scientist explaining <laughs> packet switching. So my understanding is the packet gets broken up and then not reassembled till it gets to the other end. And that's what came to be called packet switching. Um, but what it meant was it created the opportunity to create organizations that aren't just centralized. They are not only decentralized, but they're truly distributed. And that's the shift we're on. It's also very interesting that the original name Paul Barron used to describe packet switching was not packet switching. It was hot potato rooting. Hot potato rooting. Now, it's much more colorful, and I wish that word would have stuck. Um, but if you now look 10 years out from where we are now, the other uh, a big rule of thumb for us as futurists is that many really big changes take 30 to 50 years to be an overnight success. And what's happening now is that packet switching is becoming scalable scalable globally in ways that weren't possible before. So today's internet, we have something that's more like decentralized with Google and Facebook and Twitter and the various nodes. But what's next, the next generation internet, because today's internet is not secure enough, uh, it's not doesn't have enough privacy, it, the economic models aren't strong enough. So the next generation is gonna be much more truly distributed including distributed authority. And that's why things like blockchain and Bitcoin are so important to, to study and to figure out. Now, what that means is that, again, everything that anything that can be distributed will be distributed. So it means not only explicit knowledge, it also means tacit knowledge. So organizations get distributed, ideas get distributed, and they're often in these shape-shifting forms. No center can't be controlled, hierarchies come and go. So it's not clean, it's very messy how this whole process is gonna happen, but it is, it is gonna happen. And that inevitable shift from everything that can be distributed will be distributed. That's just a fact of life for us for the next decade and beyond. So um, Bob, someone is asking for clarification again between decentralized and you mentioned the way the internet is now to distributed. Can right. you paint a picture sure. for us? Sure, sure. Um, so there actually is a picture in the book <laughs> that, that shows a hierarchy and then kind of imagine, I don't, can you open to the page? Maybe you can. I can. Oh, Tell me which yeah. one. Well, if I knew the page. Oh, here it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah there, there you go. So yeah, if you hold that up. So, so there's a diagram there, centralized is on the left, decentralized is in the middle, where you have clear nodes and then little star structures around it. And truly distributed is that pattern that looks more like the fishnet lying on a dock. Uh, beautiful. Okay, that's just right. So that is the image of the direction we're going. And I would argue, even though it's a VUCA world and it's unpredictable, this is predictable. We know this is the direction we're going. We know that anything that can be distributed will be distributed. And these shape-shifting distributed organizations are the direction that we're going. Now, this 
Decentralized essentially just means you take a centralized network and you break it down into multiple centralized networks and you connect the multiple centralized networks. So that's more or less where today's internet is mostly. Uh, where you have, again, the key nodes are things like Google, although that's also part of the overall fabric, but Facebook and Twitter, and you see a number of those very clear decentralized structures. What we're moving toward is the most, more truly distributed, and in a blockchain um, is a technology I talk about quite a lot in the book about how we're going to move in this direction. And basically, blockchain is offering a way to provide a high trust way of interaction in low trust environments. So example I talk about in the book is the use of Bitcoin in countries like Argentina. Uh, again, the criminal economy is ahead of us in how they use this, but it can also be used for not only currency exchange, but also authentication. So for example, Walmart and IBM have announced they're using blockchain to track the food safety of pork products in China. And it's distributed authority to track food safety all the way down the supply chain, which is really now more of a, of a supply web than, than just a chain. So that's the shift from, from centralized to decentralized to truly distributed. And the big news from a leadership point of view is that means authority can be distributed too. So think of a simple transaction um, like we use banks for now. Um, and you have a situation where you go through an intermediary and use that intermediary for trust and for verification and it comes out the other side. What Bitcoin is doing, um, and it may or may not succeed, I mean often these signals fail, but they tend to fail in an interesting way. And this one certainly, something's going to come out of this. Uh, and it's all about distributed authority and how do you connect in ways that aren't cleanly cleanly centralized and yet there is trust and authentication that that plays out in this increasingly distributed environment and again think of it as hot potato rooting hot potato rooting uh, so as a leader how do you lead in that world where you don't just tell people what to do you're all in this in this very distributed network structure that's really helpful. Thank you, Bob. Um, here's a more personal question that I, that I uh, saw come in that I really like. Uh, Marianne is wondering, um, what are you personally fearful of when you look 10 years out? And what are you personally hopeful about? Yeah, um, so the, the core, and I, I've thought a lot about this, this question. Um, there's three things that I'm really concerned about that are, are highly unusual and I've never seen them before in my career. And there's one central element that gives me the most hope. And all three of those frightening things and my big hopeful element come from the radical connectivity we're going to have looking 10 years ahead. You know, we think, we think we're connected today. We've got these cute smartphones and they are very powerful and, and wonderful tablet devices and all that. But they're nothing like what we're going to have 10 years from now. So the connectivity is going to be so, so, so much better than it was before. Now that creates hope for me because we're able to connect, we're able to bring people together in ways they've never been brought together before. On the other hand, it also makes it easier for a very small group of very bad people to create an awful mess. So connectivity is at the root of both my fear and my hope. The three big things as you look 10 years ahead that are unprecedented. The first is global climate disruption. You know, we're already, we're already seeing elements of that all around us. Um, and yet we've got a number of people in Washington who aren't even convinced that it's real. You know, so it's, it's a very strange world we're in right now. And again, we're not an advocacy group. We're looking at alternative futures. We started looking at global climate disruption in the 70s. Uh, but we do, we're very good at aggregating expert opinion. And there's a pretty clear scientific opinion now that something's going on. It's really a question of whose model you believe. Um, but that's a really big one over the next decade, but especially over our kids' lifetimes, it becomes a really big deal. The second is um, cyber and bioterrorism. Uh, 
Um, so in July of this month, uh, DARPA in, uh, introduced a request for proposals about gene drivers, gene drives, which are basically ways of using synthetic biology to break into genetic structures. And again, humble social scientists describing this. But it's a challenge. Um, if you think about cyber and bioterrorism, um, that's really unprecedented in terms of the, of the risk, particularly if you combine that with the fact that the VUCA world is way too complicated for many people to deal with, which invites simplistic thinking. Um, and often that simplistic thinking comes from politicians or from religions. And again, I'm not an expert in the present, so I'm not commenting on the present, but that's what you look out for as a futurist. And then final, we've got the risk of pandemics at a level we haven't seen before. So those are the three big areas I'm really concerned about. Uh, what gives me hope is all this connectivity and this next generation of young people. You know, there's, there's a lot of concern and there's a, a number of uh, popular books just out over the summer, um, which are sort of wringing their hands about the next generation of kids that are growing up in digital media. And, and I realize there are concerns, there are issues, but I'm really hopeful about this generation of kids. So I think the threshold is roughly 2010. If you became an adult in 2010 or later, you were just different. And you understand the media of digital connectivity in neural, psychological, social ways that we don't uh, if we're over 21. And again, I grew up with the internet, but I don't get it either at the level that these kids get it. So I'm really optimistic about kids if, if they have hope. And that's why I say the we're on the hope game. <laughs> uh, and the neat thing about looking 10 years ahead and thinking about literature, about leadership, is we can ask, what will it take to embody realistic hope? And it's not going to be easy. But if we can, if we can inspire realistic hope in these young people, and if we can learn from them, not just teach them. I, th I think the most powerful learning technique in the human resources world right now is cross-generational mentoring. You've, you've got to have kids you're working with and young people you're working with. We have something to offer. You know, we can play the wisdom game. <laughs> if, you're, if you're 40 or over, you've got license to play the wisdom game. Um, but you've got to be around young people, and you've got to accept that they know things we don't. So I think a lot of the hand-wringing from very well-intentioned parents uh, is coming from concern about kids, but not paying enough attention to what can we learn from kids. Sure. Well, um, being a mother of some children who are in the next generation, I'm glad to hear you hopeful about about what they can accomplish and the difference they can make. Um, and there's a question from Trent that I really like, and he's um, picking up on your idea of this extreme connectivity that we may have 10 years in the future. And he's wondering how leaders can create influence when they're not present without creating overwhelming availability for themselves and less powerful members of their team who might not feel empowered to make privacy for themselves. Yes, yes, yeah, because you, um, you know, connectivity is great until you have too much connectivity. <laughs> so it's that threshold. And with global international business and time zone pressures, it's, it's very hard to avoid that. It's a dilemma, um, which I distinguish between dilemmas and problems. So problems you can solve, but dilemmas you have to manage. And Trent is asking a question about a dilemma. Now, the challenge about dilemmas is you want to be careful not to judge too soon about them. That's the classic mistake of the problem solver. On the other hand, you have to be careful not to decide too late. That's the classic mistake of the academic. So you've got to actually like the space between judging too soon and deciding too late. And the rule of thumb here is go back to the clarity doctrine. Um, what is your clarity in that space? So if you're trying to manage your time in a shape-shifting organization across multiple time zones, you're very clear about your direction and your priorities, and you keep reinforcing that. But then you're very flexible about the execution. So the good news about future work environments is we can have more flexibility now, and we can have more ways to make a living. But it does require that clarity of direction, that clarity of purpose, that clarity of meaning. 
that then gives you the space to innovate, to come up with different ways of working in between. So the real challenge is just to, to be, to go back to Trent's question, what's your clarity within that? You know, what's your priority? And that can include work priorities, but it can also include family priorities. Um, and it can include uh, physical and mental and spiritual health priorities. I mean, it depends on your organization, but that's the leadership job. What are you clear about? What's your clarity? And then create that flexibility of how, how you actually get there. That's very helpful. Um, Ezra is wondering, and this is a completely different track, what role you see artificial intelligence tools playing in a world of leadership literacies and distributed networks? Yeah, great question. Um, so um, LinkedIn and Nordstrom and Accenture uh, just organized a uh, group of chief human resources officers uh, to meet at MIT to focus on exactly that question. <laughs> so, and I was their keynote speaker. Uh, this book kicked off the discussion. Um, I think it's profoundly important. Um, the role of AI is going to have such a profound effect on how we work together. Um, I tell the story in the book about Miku. Um, so Miku is a Japanese pop star, um, and she is a complete crowdsourced virtual rendering who performs pop music that's all crowdsourced, and even her dance moves are crowdsourced. And my colleague Ben Hamamato here at the Institute has been studying her for the last three years. She does live concerts for lots of money. She performs with live musicians, um, and she's all crowdsourced. So if you think about it, she's, she's not real in the usual sense, but she certainly is real in the sense of embodying her fan base. So if you think about the future leaders, we're going to be able to embody our workforce, embody our customers in ways we've never been able to do before. Um, and when we met at MIT, we were at uh, the Center for Artificial Intelligence and Computer Science there. And one of their people was there um, introducing himself as I was coming on. Uh, and he was reminding us that the term artificial intelligence was coined 65 years ago. <laughs> at MIT by Marvin Minsky and a number of others. Um, so it's taken a very long time to get practical. But it's really interesting that now you have human resources people saying, well, what does this mean for us? So certainly there are practical ways that AI can help with matching people and tasks, can help with creating new fabric structures within these shape-shifting organizations. And it's a dramatic opportunity, I think, for the human resources function. And, and my advice to them was, don't call yourselves HR. <laughs> HR has been devalued, outsourced, and unappreciated over the last decade. But you've got a wonderful name, human resources. So what I recommend is when you say, well, where do you work? I work in human resources. But you pause in the middle. And AI fits right in the middle. So the real power of these things is not just the human. And it's certainly not just the computer, although there are cases where AI is going to automate away certain jobs. But the real power is with the augmentation of the human and the computer to create these very unusual, very powerful new kind of hybrids of the things we do best and the things computers do best. Great. Um, so I'm going to loop back to a question that's come in from a couple of attendees wondering about how to integrate the new leadership literacies into government structures and what some good first steps might be. Uh, next question. <laughs> that's funny. Okay, we can skip that one. No worries. I just, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I wish I had a better answer. I wish I had a better answer. Um, these exchanges that I've had um, since 9-11, I've volunteered to bring CEOs and senior executive groups to the Army War College in Carlisle and in Washington um, to have exchanges. And we brought in politicians and we brought in nonprofits and governments and all that. I've come away much more impressed with the military. I've come away much less impressed with our politicians of either party. So it really is troubling to me. Um, we've got a profound opportunity in the face of this future to create new leadership models. But we are so polarized. You know, I call it the polarities of the present. 
And within most of the government agencies, in our government anyway, there isn't much interest in or focus on the future, um, except for the military. You know, they're on it. Uh, and some of the environmental groups and some of the health uh, groups, you can, you can definitely see the future orientation. So I think it's a big challenge. Now, maybe to try to draw an optimistic uh, interpretation out of that, you are seeing new grassroots community structures emerging that are shape-shifting organizations. And many of those could evolve into political environments. But I hope they do it without getting polarized and politicized. You know, that's the real tension. Um, I do like the fact that thinking about the long-term future, does attempt and often succeeds in bringing you away from the polarities in the present. So for example, we did a project for uh, Syngenta, one of the world's largest uh, agricultural and seed companies. And we were focused on the future of food security. Was focused on Western Europe. We realized that you couldn't talk about food security in Western Europe because the conversation was too polarized and politicized around GMO foods. And there's this sincere belief that GMO is a yes, no choice. Um, if you look 30 years out and you say you're interested in hunger and food security, you realize that food chemistry is not a yes and no choice. <laughs> it's a spectrum of choices and you have to be interested in it. It's not a yes, no choice. So the challenges in the VUCA world politicians and many of the people who vote for him get sucked into this yes or no world. Um, you know, simplistic arguments on the left, simplistic arguments on the right, um, and the politicians are kind of stuck in the middle. So I'm really concerned about how the political environments are playing out. Um, my most optimistic side of this is you are seeing now new grassroots structures that are kind of saying, wait a minute, you can't continue this way. <laughs> We've got to look at alternative ways of dealing with it. And, and thank God we do have some policymakers, particularly from the military side, but that has its own risks, uh, who are really good at these kinds of roles. That's very helpful. So Bob, I'm wondering, is it possible for you to go back and review the the leadership literacies from a previous slide. We did have someone who wanted to, to review sure. those, and I thought that might be helpful as we come close to the end of our hour in case it spurs any additional questions from folks. Sure. Um, it, the design here was, um, was really uh, the genius of Gene Hagen and Trent Kuhn and, at the Institute to come up with this more organic swirl image and then Archie Ferguson, the, the famous cover designer, did the book cover to incorporate that into the, the design of the cover. But this, to me, this swirl, this swirl is really the future. <laughs> you know, this is, so if you, if you want to want to get deep into the forecast, ignore the words and just look at the patterns. Um, you know, that's the kind of future we're around. There are these swirls, these energetic, colorful, varied, um, asymmetrical kinds of swirls. This is even a little too symmetrical for me, but it's a lot less symmetrical than most people talk about when they think about the future. But focus on the swirls, not just the words. Got it. And would you um, really quickly just walk us through those five literacies as we wrap up the hour together? Sure. Uh, so the core is foresight inside action. You know, it used to be that great management consultants could make a living telling, telling leaders to be action oriented. <laughs> you know, that leaders should make quick decisions and be bold and move ahead. And now in the VUCA world, if, you, if you're action oriented, but you have no foresight or you have no insight, um, you run the risk of being dumb, dangerous, or both. Uh, so what you need in this world is a constant cycling of foresight inside action. You know, thinking at least 10 years ahead for foresight and, and the external view really helps. Then you've got to get uh, really good at voluntary fear engagement. So if you, um, if you look 10 years ahead at leadership team for um, all of the world's great companies, most of them will be gamers. You know, most of them will be gamers, not in the sense of today's video games necessarily, but in the sense of immersive learning, cross-cultural learning, the ability to use digital interfaces to engage in the future and try out things in a low-risk way. 
leadership for shape-shifting organizations, this is the inevitable path we're on. Uh, hierarchies will only work in stable environments, in predictable environments, and there won't be that many of those. So if hierarchies work, more power to you, but in most cases they won't work. So it means leaders have to figure out how to lead in these shape-shifting organizations. And it's interesting, I debated what to call this, but I kept the term shape-shifting because it, it has a slightly spiritual element to it. You know, there was, uh, in Harry Potter, there was a professor at Hogwarts who taught shape-shifting. <laughs> and, and I kind of like that association. There's a certain magical element to this. Uh, it isn't just a linear, predictable kind of structure, very organic. And being there without being there, um, this is the discipline of choosing which medium is good for what. And in general, those of us um, over 21 are better in person, and we degrade the further we get away. If you're less than 21, you're very good uh, at social media, at gaming, at various kinds of virtual connectivity, connectivity, but you may not be very good in person. <laughs> so, you know, the, the neat thing that parents can do, this is maybe the world's greatest opportunity for great parenting, is learn from your kids, because they'll know things you don't, and yet mentor your kids about in-person communication and also uh, about making you know healthy and moral choices in this in this world of the web, and then finally having this discipline of creating and sustaining positive energy um, in the belief that that all leaders are going to have to be super healthy to to thrive in this kind of world. Thanks so much. Um, maybe we can go back to the final slide. I want to make sure that our attendees today know how to learn more from you and more from the Institute for the Future. So you can find, if, uh, can you go back to that, that final slide for me, Bob? Yeah, sorry. No worries, we lost it. <laughs> made my um, first mistake here. No worries, it's all pretty smooth, I think. Um, so you can <laughs> find out more. Yes, you can find out more about the book and about Bob at newleadershipliteracies.org. Um, you can also email Bob, and his address is here. Uh, again, we are going to also send a PDF of these slides, so the email address will be included. If you're interested in bringing Bob to your organization to talk more about the book and about this concept of going 10 years into the future, um, you can contact Ashley, who's Bob's assistant, and her email address will be here as well. And if you're interested in finding out about how to buy the book in bulk, you can contact Leslie Crandall. I'm going to put all of this information in our follow-up email. Um, and for those of you who have stuck around with us, many of you, um, until these last moments, you can also email me, webinars at weavinginfluence.com, and I'll type that in the chat window. And what we'd love to hear is your feedback about today's session. Where did you find value? Uh, what most influence you? What are you still thinking about? What would you like to learn more about? Um, from those people who send feedback, we are going to select two winners and send some books out. But as I mentioned earlier on the call, the book is available on Amazon and other online booksellers now. And so we encourage you to go and get your copy. I happen to have mine with this beautiful cover in my hands today. Um, so again, you can email me webinars at weavinginfluence.com and I'll type that in the chat. And uh, Bob, I know that every time I talk to you, my mind just starts to swirl and it can be overwhelming to, to really think about these lofty and uh, far reaching concepts. Do you have any parting wisdom for us? Uh, the action that you might like people to take as a result of thinking about these topics? Sure, um, I, I think, the challenge is to acknowledge all this uncertainty around us, all this connectivity around us, but then kind of go inside yourself and say, okay, what, what's my center given this? Uh, and come up with something that is clear and is simple without being simplistic. Um, this is a very complicated next decade, a very frightening next decade, and yet, it's very possible, if we're clear about direction, it's very possible to create a very hopeful world out of it. Great. Thank you so much, Bob, and congratulations on the publication of the book. I know it will make a big difference in the world. Thank you, Becky. I hope so. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us.